mean, science after all is the word stand for overstanding rather than understanding, that we can really be able to understand what is going on with the polar bear itself. I mean, rather than just simply saying, huh, emit more of this carbon dioxide is going to kill the polar bear. That is clearly not true. And in fact, now let's go back to the basic. You may have heard many times over that people say, we have somewhat of a data, like let's say in the 50s and the 60s, the estimate, the best estimate, which is not very accurate, of course, of the polar bear in the world is maybe running from about 5,000 to 10,000. Okay? And then the current estimate, the number could go from 20,000 to even up to 27 or 28 I've seen. Okay? And guess what happened during that period? It clearly has nothing to do with uh, the warming temperature too. All that effects of increased uh, population was mainly due to an agreement that we all signed in about 1970, actually early 70s. The world, you know, Arctic regions or countries agreed to sign to an agreement that we're going to have a lot more limited take of the polar bear in the sense of hunting for it, right? Because traditional life still depends on polar bear actually as food, as clothing, as all kinds of stuff, where where you will have a lot more systematic and control, and, and this is where the management of the polar bear life management beginning to come in, which I think is completely a healthy thing to do. Because after all, we don't want to senselessly kill them, you know, and hunt them down until they could not really have a chance to even survive. I think that it is that kind of commonsensical thing that is actually missing from today's argument, which is a shame in a lot of ways, because after all, as you say, all of us have very, very good will. We all have a very extremely good will in terms of trying to make the world a better place for everyone. No doubt about that. And then how come we could not even communicate such basic discussion? We couldn't even get such a discussion going. In fact, you will see how many times they're trying to stop me from even saying this thing that I'm saying to you. I wrote already three papers on this. One of the paper, by the way, we were contracted by the state of Alaska government to write this paper. And immediately, guess what? They managed to say that we are some kind of pet to uh, Sarah Palin, which is obviously not true. I mean, it's not even coming from her. It's just one of the state office that is controlling or studying a polar bear's population. They do wanted to know whether some of the prediction that is offered by this U.S. Geological Survey is true because U.S. Geological Survey came out with the, the report that's saying, well, you know, by 2050, we know that if we don't do nothing about cutting down CO2 emission, that two-thirds of the world population, 66.7% of the polar bear will die off. That is a remarkable statement to make, by the way. And then my job was simply just to go into the step in which these people are making the projection or the prediction. And then we just check every single step that they do. And then in parts where we don't understand what they did, we ask them questions, they refuse to cooperate, so on and so forth. So we, we wrote our papers and then we come up with the conclusion, we don't think this uh, projection is correct because it has not followed all this scientific procedure that we're supposed to follow. And that makes myself a public enemy number one. I mean, I'm probably the person who really wants to kill the world polar bear, according to them, which, of course, is obviously untrue in that sense. So this is why I keep emphasizing a very simple theme for me. I'm a very simple scientist in a very simple way, uncomplicated way that I only wanted to learn what the facts are. The rest of it, I say that most of these politicians, please do your best. God bless and do your best. But then please, don't try to misinform and sell people things that is not true. And be very careful. And then the public, of course, also should have a duty themselves to try to learn all this information instead of being fed by the media, especially the mainstream media who's really incapable of, of, of getting at the truth, in my opinion, because they have been biased from day one. I don't know for what reason, I don't know. But all I know is that it's been extremely difficult to try to get the mainstream media to even hear any of this because they just choose not to. It's, it's a very strange phenomenon. I really think that, you know, if they have the stronger truth, please come out and say it. Willie, in my experience, being on a mission for 25 years, true discovery can only happen when it's funded in such a way that true discovery is free and clear of being co-opted politically and stifled and the people involved being in bondage. Academia is notorious, I would say over the last 20 years, of being co-opted by corporate concerns and shackles. And I'm not saying all academia is stuck or co-opted. I'm saying a large part of academia has already been infiltrated and polluted. 
And that is why I think, as I'm listening to you and doing mostly a lot of listening, as an audience person would do, that you've gone through what you're going through. Because in order to be true to science, you have to be willing to find out the truth and you have to be empowered to ask the questions that nobody wants to ask because it's tough. It's tough to ask the tough questions, the good questions. It's a pleasure because that's really who you are and what your work's about. But unfortunately, academia has become political and getting money is political. And even though you've gotten money from a lot of different places, you're still true to your science. But you're in an environment or you dwell in an environment of inquiry that's very shackled. And therefore, that's why I think a lot of what you've gone through is very, very disempowering for you. But I appreciate your courage in coming out and your willingness to educate the mainstream public, those that are interested. I think one of the saddest things in this subject that I've seen, and I've watched a lot of YouTube videos just to even get a, a handle on how both the science is going and being spoken about, but also the politics and the legalization of the obstruction of a piece of science. And when former Vice President Gore says that this is really a concluded subject and it's already agreed upon, like it's a done deal, that's very sad to me. And you have to understand too that citizens in this country and individuals and People in different parts of the world get very connected to who they feel and perceive their leaders to be. And so many environmental advocates and activists who were glad that he cared about something regarding the environment. And it's easy for a person to lose their way, their ability to discern quickly when they look to outside leaders, particularly political leaders, to be feeding them the distillation of the truth or purity. And the reality is, unfortunately, that any politician, whether they're in politics or out of politics, formally or informally, the minute something is concluded in the realm of something as complex as climate, with the omission of even the sun's contribution, let alone everything else that you've mentioned, you have an obstruction of science. You have an obstruction of the truth via omission. And omission is the portal to something being obstructed. It's as bad as giving polluted information, not giving verifiable, correct information. And so I feel very sad. Well, I can, I can add one more observation that I have that I... I, I can never, ever imagine, actually, as a practicing scientist to even witness such a thing. I mean, that happens only two, three years ago at one of the biggest meeting of the Earth scientists in the American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco in December. They invited Mr. Gore to speak. And I cannot tell you how many times he has falsely presented the information and I can only imagine that when you hear things that is not true, uh, again, I have to tell you that this is not just me knowing it, and I have to say that I would say maybe 80% of the crowd is smart enough to know that. And I keep hearing applause. I'm really totally shocked. You would politely not clap when somebody says something not true. In fact, some of them is close to lies. And then, of course, you oftentimes even hear some of the scientists who, of course, I don't no longer call them scientists because I really put them in quote, scientists. They would even say, well, you know, Mr. Gore has done a service. I've learned something from it. I mean, it's a fairly amazing phenomenon, okay? It's a reverse of the situation. I've learned something from it. It's a fairly amazing phenomenon, okay? It's a reverse of the situation. The more most intelligent, supposed to be intelligent organization on this earth science, study of the earth, that you have all these leaders coming up and talking opposite. You're supposed to tell Mr. Gore what the truth is. In fact, I can assure you, he has some of the best information available, a person of that importance. The simple fact of, uh, for example, the, the, the graph that he showed in, in Inconvenient Truth on the level of carbon dioxide and temperature, right, for the ice core record that goes back 650,000 years. The fact that when the data first came out in a shorter form, for about 160,000 years in 1987. 
Mr. Gore was already know about that results. In fact, in 1992, in Earth and Balance, he 